Welcome, welcome, welcome. A.R. Hayes, a convict's thoughts. For the first time, we discuss the Delphi murder case. What a crazy twist of events, right? But does it really shock anybody in a case like this? I'm very new. I, I just started actually looking at this case as I've been focused mainly on the Idaho 4 tragedy and also within some actual personal projects. I've only heard the rumblings of this case. I've had many people kind of sprinkle some ideas and some thoughts my way regarding the case and me not being very uh, schooled or educated on the information of the case. I didn't really speak upon it because I... I I hadn't looked at it, I hadn't studied it, so what could I offer, correct? So today I've actually, I, I mean it just really opened my eyes because a couple of people had some good questions that I could use a little bit of my experiences and my past to explain, but I wanted to know a few of the basics of the case so that I could speak them with you. Obviously, first of all, we got to speak about liberty and Abigail, the two young ladies who lost their lives in this case. Heartbreaking for young ladies of that age to be taken out of the happiness of life, to be sent to heaven, no matter who committed that type of crime. It's sad and it's heartbreaking. So definitely we send all of our love and our thoughts, not only to themselves, but to their family members and everybody that is surrounding them within this case very important that they all know that they're loved being hugged and thought about from a distance so Richard Allen sounds like to me he's not really getting a very fair shake in this ordeal whether he committed the crime or not I can't state to that fact as of yet because I haven't dove deep enough into the information to try to get a firm grasp in my mind of what I would think happened, who could have done it, or why. But I'll tell you what, I opened up the PCA for this case for the very first time and it blew my mind that right away within the first paragraph of that page it is clearly stated hearsay is being used as a credible form of evidence in this case. Hearsay. What in the daylights is going on where a police affidavit for an arrest, its initial statement is hearsay? Look, I get it. A PCA is a theory-based affidavit to secure an arrest warrant. A theory-based that's not hearsay, ladies and gentlemen. You have to have some fact and some backed up evidence to build that theory. Hearsay is not evidence to build for an arrest warrant. So right off the bat, I kind of shook my head and I thought to myself, oh, here we go. Now, just recently I've heard about the new cult type accusation that the defense wanted to make in regards to defending their client. I'm going to dive more into those ideas before I speak upon them because I do know many of people that are within the Odinite uh, beliefs, Odinism, they're considered to be Odinites. I know the proper way that the religion is followed and I've been around people within the uh, incarcerated world that follow that and they are pure Odinites and they would not have been involved in some sort of cult like what they're explaining. So I need to dive a little more with into what that cult would be before I can properly speak upon it. I'm sure I'll learn quick and then I'll find the differences between what I knew and what they are and I'll better be able to explain that to you. Now there are a couple of things that, like I said, I wanted to speak to you about right automatically within the first video that I do on this, and that's public defenders, how they can withdraw or be removed from a case because I've experienced that myself and I know what transpires and how the case moves forward after that's done. And two, I'm also going to speak to you about how a jail inmate supposedly supposed to be 
housed in a county jail setting can be housed in a correctional facility and even moved within the prison system. Is it the correct manner that it's supposed to be done? Not normally, and I'll explain that to you so you can better understand that. So let's dive in. Let's start with a public defender like what has happened in the Richard Allen case, I guess just in a matter of hours prior to a hearing, both of his council members withdrew off of the case. Now, they are both public defenders. Let me explain to you something real quick before I dive into this. Public defenders are overworked and handle numerous cases at one time. Is it fair? Probably not, not only for them to be able to do the due diligence on the case that they're currently working, but also for the client that would want for an attorney to focus their sole full effort on their case, especially one that's of the magnitude of the Delphi murder case. Now, not all public defenders are lower level attorneys. There are very qualified and high level attorneys within the public defender's office and even sometimes there are outside private attorneys that are brought in to represent clients pro bono and pretty much act as if they are a part of the public defender's office. They have some sort of agreement or contract where they will come in and help with the caseload, especially in the higher magnitude cases like this one. Look at the Brian Koberger case. Yes, they are public defenders, but they are also reaching out. They're getting more privatized, higher level, death penalty qualified attorneys to come in and take that case. Sometimes that's mandated by the courts. I would think in the Delphi murders, even without having to dive in and really dig into how and why certain people will be on that case, uh, I would suspect that he should have higher uh, level attorneys fighting for his behalf. Now, it sounds like there's some real weird stuff going on in regards to some leaked photos that were taken by an associate out of an office of the public defenders that compromised certain things within the, the lawyers. And, and I haven't got all the gist of it, but it sounds like it threw them under the bus and it forced the withdrawal of these public defenders from the case. My question is, were they really forced to resign or did they do it on their own? In my opinion, they did not withdraw on their own because it sounds like they wanted to stay with on the case and actually felt bad in regards to being removed from the case. So this is from a higher up removing them and pressuring them to leave this case. And I think we're going to hear some more oddities come out about that through time because this is another case that right off the bat, I'm getting the gist is not being run through the judicial system correctly and i know people will jump on me and say well why do you say that all of our justice systems handles everything a certain way and it's all ran not every case is ran correctly ladies and gentlemen not every investigation is done appropriately mistakes happen and unfortunately they get magnified in certain cases and that's why mistrials and certain things happen this one's not sounding good as I dive a little more into it. Since the accusations were made in regards to the cult, evidently a, a life was lost, whether it be uh, taken on their very own or whether somebody may have caused that be a foul play. We don't really know because it's being kept behind the scenes. I haven't dove in deep enough to even know the name of the gentleman. I just know rumblings of what transpired. But that's never a good sign when somebody has lost their life within the defense side of the case. And then miraculously, not long after that, both attorneys recuse themselves from the case. Sounds like there's some issues there. there there's something going that is a little more in-depth than what many of us understand. Now, 
defense attorneys, and here's what I find really odd and really weird, are not normally capable of recusing themselves from a case unless there is an actual issue between them and their client and it goes through a process within the courts that gets hearings in front of the judge before the judge makes the de determination that they're actually off of the case especially one that's been going on these this long and with all the discovery that's been turned over and all the studying of said discovery and then all the court hearings based off of that discovery it's really crazy that just out of the blue two hours before a hearing a judge would walk in nonchalantly and just act as if everything's okay and the case is going to proceed forward as if nothing bad had happened i'm shaking my head thinking even if Everything was on the up and up of these two attorneys recusing themselves from the case. You have to give this defendant's new attorneys enough time to get on top of everything going on with this case and on board fully understanding everything that they're looking at because they haven't even been able to look at the discovery. Excuse me. Get a sneeze. Haven't even been able to look at the discovery or anything about this case they've been working the other cases these are still public defenders that are going to have to take on this case these are not privatized lawyers that are going to come out hired by their client that are already going to be jumping right in and getting all this info in a quick manner it's going to take time especially when the court has to make the statement that the prior public defenders still have to return all the discovery back to the courts which will then distribute it to the new public defenders yet she makes the claim that the old public defenders will stay on to help catch the new ones up to speed my question is then if they recuse themselves why are they staying on to help catch the others up to speed why are they just not still working the case something really shady really kind of crazy about that I've had a couple of instances, ladies and gentlemen, where lawyers recuse themselves from my cases. The main key of the reasoning why is because them and I, me and them, disagreed in how we were going to move forward with the case. One of them actually dismissed themselves because I lied about some evidence which was found out down the road by my attorneys i had lied and hidden things from them and then it shocked them and i mean it, it was not just a small amount of uh, a part of my case it was the majority the biggest part of my case so then they were just baffled by why i would even lie to them and i would hide that information and so we made the agreement between them and i that they could no longer represent me because i wanted to take my uh, case to trial and i wanted to battle on a certain point and they they did not see eye to eye with me on that and didn't want to do it so we went before the judge and i stood before the judge and fired them they didn't recuse themselves i fired them and when you are a defendant you have the right to put into the court that you want to release or fire your attorneys the court doesn't have to accept that ladies and gentlemen they can deny that especially when it becomes an issue with a public defender because the courts do understand public defenders are overwhelmed and they can't just get another one on your case and up to speed in a heartbeat it's going to slow down the whole process this man's already been sitting in jail for quite a while and from what i understand there's a lot of questions within this case uh, and I, I understand there's probably some solid evidence as well. So I'm not going to discredit that he shouldn't be sitting there. But I see some issues within already, within my first day of even looking at this, lawyers recusing themselves without actually having to go through the process of that happening. Doesn't make sense to me. I'm shaking my head. And I got to go in. I got to look at the statues of Indiana and the, the different ch differences in the laws that they have compared to the states that I've, you know, done my time in and where I've had to go to court. 
I have not had to go to court in Indiana. I've been housed in Indiana in exchange programs, so I've been in some of the facilities this guy potentially could see, um, and they weren't pleasant, but I did not go through the actual justice system there, so I might have to really deep dive into a lot of the legality side of that, and no, I'm not a lawyer, but I do understand what I'm looking at, and I do have people that I can discuss things with and i have no problem reaching out to the actual judicial system in indiana to get answers to my questions i'm not afraid to do that so i most likely will i do not like what i see with what just transpired in this court it really puts a sour taste in my mouth and i think richard allen in this case that's a screw job right off the bat and i did not like the fact I watched a judge just nonchalantly explaining the fact she's going to continue to move forward literally with a court hearing in the very near future that there's no possible way the new lawyers or you know people representing anybody would even be able to caught up be caught up to speed on so I have an issue with that ladies and gentlemen as a defendant in many of my own cases I would definitely have an issue with that now whether or not richard allen has a voice that could be heard or one of his supporters or family members from the outside has a voice that could be heard i don't know but for all of us sitting out here all of you sitting there tonight it is a beautiful friday night and i hope all of you guys are prepared to have a great weekend i hope each and every one of you can feel it in your chest if that was you or one of your loved ones and something like this transpired just in the middle of your case and right before a big hearing you would kind of have to shake your head and wish for better than that so yes Ladies and gentlemen, I've had lawyers want to get off my cases, but we had to go through a process. It was not two hours before a hearing, and the judge didn't just miraculously grant it and allow it to happen that quickly. So I find that to be troublesome. My opinion, some may not agree, but that's my opinion. If I were sitting at that defense table, I would take major issue to that, and I would be pushing for, hey, I need a mistrial right now so we could start this entire thing all over again. I need better representation that's going to stick out the long course with me, and they're going to fight my case the way that it should be appropriately fought. So, moving on. Let, let's talk. A little bit of experience on this one as well. We clearly have a county jail inmate has not been sentenced or found guilty of the crimes he's been charged with, yet he's being housed in a correctional facility deemed to be prison inmate worthy and housing. Is that allowable? Ladies and gentlemen, it should not be. Everywhere I've been, (laughs) everywhere I've been, I've been a lot of places locked up. They keep all county inmates separate from DOC inmates. DOC is Department of Corrections. Okay, that's prison. County jail, that's a totally different ramification of what an inmate is. You are not sentenced. There's a liability to that. Okay, everywhere I've been. If a county inmate that has not been sentenced had hands laid upon them by a DOC inmate, that is lawsuit city. Now, I will tell you this. There are facilities within our country that house both. There is a county jail side, and they have their certain lockup areas. And then you have the DOC side. They are separated, ladies and gentlemen. They do not co-mingle. Now, I have not looked at it enough to see how they're housing Richard Allen. I'm assuming he's in solitary confinement. That would be my guess. It sounds like they're moving him around, which 
that's never pleasant and it does not normally happen. So if people ask me the question, do inmates in county jail get moved around as often as Richard Allen is? No, they do not. Do they put an inmate from county jail that's unsentenced into solitary confinement surrounded by DOC solitary confinement inmates? No, they do not. Now, when they bring a DOC inmate back from prison to county jail on new charges, it happens a lot, ladies and gentlemen, it happens a lot. A DOC prison inmate will be brought back to the county jail to face new charges. I've been through it multiple of times. Can we be put into the same pod as normal jail inmates? I've had it actually happen. Yes, I have had that happen. However, we were all the same custody level and normally what that meant is we were max level or higher and we were kept within single man cells in a pod that single individuals could come out at one hour at a time during the day to use the phone and showers meaning we did not co-mingle we did not go to rent together we didn't eat lunch or breakfast together we didn't come out in the day room together we weren't in the shower area together none of that they kept us separate it was solitary confinement now i've heard of some states that have allowed the mixture of a doc inmate coming back to county jail and being mixed in with jail inmates I don't know how that works because it's never happened for me. I don't know what states allow it, and I don't know the legality of how they're able to accomplish that. But typically, if you are a prison inmate coming back to a county jail, you're at least medium to high custody or higher. So I would think it would be a cell living, uh, kind of a, a lockdown solitary confinement type ordeal. I don't know that to be fact, but that's what I would think. Normally, when I was in a jail setting coming back from DOC, I was call, it's called a DOC pod, meaning everybody in there had come back from Department of Corrections. So we didn't have the jail inmates in there with us unless they were trusting, bringing our cleaning supplies, delivering our food, some of that nature, but they were always surrounded by uh deputy officers and, and and people working within the jail so they were never just left there to where if we wanted to get our hands on them, we could most times there are issues even when we were in solitary confinement we did not like when we came back from the penitentiary we did not like county jail inmates just because they hadn't earned their status of a doc inmate yet so we didn't respect them as much. So if we were ever to get into a conflict of interest with them, it typically turns violent. And it's sad, but that's just the way it was. Someone like Richard Allen, having killed these two young ladies, being mixed in with DOC inmates would never be a good thing. These are two juvenile young ladies. Gruesome crime. That would not be taken well by DOC inmates. This is what they would call, uh, you would have to go to a protective custody yard or really be hidden within a solitary confinement. You couldn't walk a normal yard with crimes like this. And people ask me, well, what's the difference between, you know, the, the Idaho 4 case compared to what the delphi case would be in housing on a penitentiary you're talking about age of the females and what i've seen a little bit of of the delphi case it's not appropriate for someone to be put onto a prison yard so it would not be good where we haven't heard of anything um i guess sexually based or outrageously sickening within the Idaho for past the the actual taking of the lives and the brutality of that 
that ladies and gentlemen does not get somebody hemmed up on a yard i'm sorry it just doesn't i know many are wishing for that but that's not going to get you classified out and have your life taken or at risk on a prison yard the delphi case yes it absolutely would because the age of the young ladies just like to chris watts they had to send him all the way across the country they couldn't even house him in the state that he committed his crimes in same thing would happen in whoever gets sentenced in this crime they won't house him within the state they'll they'll send him somewhere else on a trade program so to sum up the little bit that I know within the Delphi case, and I'm going to really be speed studying so that I can do more endeavors with you guys, because I know there are many that are very interested in the take on this case, especially from a view of maybe someone that's known people that have done things like this. And unfortunately, I have been around inmates that have done horrifically bad crimes like this i've been in the solitary confinement units and this is where they hide people like this mark godot out of the baseline rapist out of arizona unfortunately i was on the same run as him and he he had uh, cases like this so it it's sickening and it's sad but guys there's a lot of craziness going on in the judicial system across the board and across the united states right now in many cases and this delphi case i in the first few minutes of even starting to study this like i told you my head's already spinning it seems very crazy to me i need to look at the cult aspect just to kind of see if maybe there's something tied into that i don't know if there is or not i really don't but at this point the little bit that i have seen i'm going to say there's some shadiness already going on within the the judicial system and the inner workings of this case so gonna dive in more hopefully you stay tuned with me on that this is video one of a couple today i'm going to do uh get back into the idaho four and speak upon a couple of things regarding that as well so stay tuned stay uh stay supportive of the channel truly love all of you appreciate every single one of you and we'll talk more delphi very very soon have a great night